Hello YouTube, Sandre here. Today I'm going to talk about Jordan Peterson. This is a video that I've been uh, planning to do for a while actually, but it wasn't until a couple of his fanboys decided to flag my video into a limited state for a while that I decided to stop kicking the can further down the road and just actually get this over with. However, they've really pissed me off now, so this is going to become a series. Yes, there's a lot of faults that I can find with Jordan Peterson, and this video is just going to highlight one of them. Mind you, I don't hate Jordan Peterson by any means. In fact, I respect the man in many ways. I like his stance on free speech. I like the work he has done in the spirit of free speech. I think he has done a lot of good work when it comes to that area. I also like listening to some of his lectures about archetypes, and his insights into psychology are downright fascinating. However, there are a couple of areas where he simply just doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, or where he is overreaching and tries to make false comparisons, and employ other dishonest tactics to try and get his point across. I also find his appeal to tradition to be downright ridiculous at times, but all of that in time. In this video I'm going to focus on his supposed view of morality, and why I find it to be kind of, um, dumb? Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really not doing a good job so far in, in, in seeming, uh, in, in seeming like I don't hate the guy. Um, anyway, let's, let's move on. Now, Jordan Peterson derives his morality, according to himself, from the Christian faith. And this has led him to make some baffling suggestions and proclamations. But before I get to that, let me get to his view of atheists. You see, he doesn't just propose Christian values, which in of itself is kind of harmless, but he actually has, in my opinion, a pretty skewed view of what atheists actually are. He actually makes the claim that atheists actually do secretly believe in God. Just watch this. This is the argument that I tried to level at Sam Harris with regards to the metaphysical foundations of his ethics. It's like, it's the same sort of thing. It's, and I think Ben Shapiro just went after him on the same grounds, is that I don't care what you say about whether or not you're an atheist, an atheist you act like you're part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And so, you think you don't believe, but I think you do. But we have different definitions of what the word believe means. Yes, you can be a non-believer. But the funny thing about that is, too, you can't be a non-believer in your action, you see, because Harris's metaphysics is fundamentally Christian. So he acts out a Christian metaphysics, but he says, well, I don't believe it. It's like, well, yeah, you do, because you're acting it out. You just say you don't believe it, but what you, you believe what do you it. Mean, what do you mean he's acting, acting it out? Like what, for example? Well, he doesn't rob banks, doesn't kill people, doesn't rape, doesn't murder. Now, anyone who is a veteran on YouTube like myself will realize that this is eerily similar to some other groups of people that there was a big hullabaloo around many, many years ago. You see, I started my now streaming channel uh, back in 2008. By then, you had this supposed argument, if you will although it wasn't really much of an argument, between atheists and Christian apologists. Now, I want you to compare what these apologists that I'm about to show have to say to what Jordan Peterson is saying. If, if God doesn't exist, the truth is, Kevin, they know he exists. Oh, of course. They hate him. That's, that's what that's it's all exactly about. That's exactly what it is, and that's pretty much what my character is and in, in the movie God's Not Dead. I mean, it... <laughs> I know these guys must believe in something, otherwise they wouldn't get so angry about it. And they don't like the fact that there's a higher power out there that's judging how they live their lives. If there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. Some people say, well, I don't need God to be a good person. I can be a good person even if I'm an atheist. And I agree that you don't need to believe in God in order to follow personal or cultural codes of morality. However, I do think, though, that the concept of a good person loses its, its objectivity if God does not exist. If God does not exist, then goodness is really relative to the individual or to society. 
And it's true, someone could think they're a good person, but there are many evil people that think highly of themselves. So morality can't come from the individual. But there are also evil societies that do terrible and wicked things. So morality has to transcend society as well. So if we believe there's a standard for what a good person is that transcends time, place, and culture, then logically there would have to be a supremely good or perfect person that transcends time, place, and culture, or what we would call God. And in my book, Answering Atheism, I defend this argument for the existence of God called the moral argument. I show how there are objective moral truths and that only God can account for them. And I examine various objections atheists make to this argument. If there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. Author and editor of ProofThatGodExists.org, a site that I have found absolutely fascinating as it, it gives us or shows us why logic, science, and morality are consistent with the Christian worldview and not with any other world. Keep evidence on people who say that they don't believe in God. What I do is I take their masks off. They say that there is no God, and I show them using logic, science, and morality that they actually do believe in God. We talked about how the Bible is our ultimate authority. Uh, there really are, aren't any atheists or agnostics or unbelievers. They all are guilty when they stand before God. They yeah. all do know that God They exists. will not have an, uh, an excuse because they really are believers. They That's just right. suppress that truth. If there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. I'm going to tell you what these atheist demons believe, what the fundamental core ethics of their philosophies is, so that you can be aware and that you can be prepared when they come at you with these here demon ba demon battle philosophy type, type tricks to try to mess you up and take you to the way of the devil. They believe that you can live a life that's decent without the laws of God. They have the nerve to believe that humanity don't need the laws that God wrote down in the book, the wonderful book he gave us called the Bible. But they never even stop to think how messed up we'd be without these laws. You look at the Ten Commandments, say thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. If, if, if you didn't have them laws, how, you, you be at the dinner table eating, eating, eating supper, and you turn your head and, 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 and grandmammy would be stealing food off the plate. If there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. You see, just like these Christian apologists, Jordan Peterson is arguing atheists secretly believe in God, or at least believe in divine rule. This is called presuppositional apologetics. I'm not going to go into too much detail into what that is, but there's a link below where you can read about it. You see, a very big problem with this idea is, well, for the first of all, what he considers to be Christian morality are in fact moral values that have been around since before even ancient times. Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments here. Four of the Ten Commandments don't even really have anything to do with morality. What remains of the Ten Commandments are pretty self-evident. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, these are pretty obvious, but we see in the animal kingdom, especially in our primate cousins, simple but strict moral codes, if you will. In the tribes, there are clear rules as to what is and isn't allowed. And even though it's not nearly as refined as the philosophy of human beings, it is definitely absolute. It is definitely absolute. The point I'm making here is that the morals that Jordan Peterson is speaking of have evolved through selection processes throughout our history. There is a basic moral fundamental truth that Jordan Peterson can simply not ignore. Do unto others what you want them to do to you. Yes, the golden rule. The practice of this and its validity can be seen in examples such as the prisoner's dilemma. What will happen when we have total strangers compete over a briefcase full of cash? Will they work together and split it? Or will they try to steal it from each other? You can play along at home by putting yourself in their position. What's up, guys? Hey, what's up? How you doing? Welcome to Split or Steal. Meet our first pair of strangers, David and Alyssa. As you can see, this briefcase is loaded 
with some nice green cash. <laughs> okay, so here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna give you guys these cards, and basically you guys are gonna make a decision that's going to determine what happens to this money, okay? okay. Now, if you both choose to split the money, you guys get to split it equally, win-win, okay? If one of you chooses to split and the other one chooses to steal, then the one that chooses to steal takes all the money. Ugh. Now, if you both choose to steal, then nobody gets anything. So keep that in mind. Okay. I'm giving you the cards. You're going to make a decision, but don't reveal the decision to each other yet. What would you do if you were playing against a total stranger like her? Do you trust that smile to split the money, or do you think she'll try to steal? And what about this guy? Should I trust? Oh, I don't know. Would you choose differently if you were playing against him? Have you made your choice yet? Now let's see theirs. Okay, you guys ready for the big reveal? And in three, two, one. Reveal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they both chose split. So they'll share the money. Is that what you guessed? That means you both get to keep half the money. Let's play again. Meet Faith and Ken. Remember, they're total strangers. You're playing against Ken. Do you trust him enough to choose split? Or do you think he's the kind of guy who would steal from you? Time to make your choice. Three, two, one. Split and split. Unbelievable. So how did you do? Did you choose to steal from him? Or did you split the money? You guys both get to split the money equally. In fact, the majority of the people we tried this on chose split, even though they were strangers and had no reason to trust one another. Three, two, one. Split? Fantastic. You both get half the money. So let me ask you, why did you decide to split? I trusted his eyes. Did you hesitate even for a moment? I thought about steal, but then I looked at her and I said no. Are you surprised that three pairs of total strangers decided to split the cash? Is that what you were expecting? Of course, not everyone is the trusting type. Are you ready to play split or steal? Are you ready? I'm ready. Reveal. I'm sorry. <laughs> By choosing to steal, William gets to walk away with all the money. So it turns out for him, <laughs> greed is good. Welcome to New York. <laughs> so how did you do? Are you surprised that more people didn't try to steal the cash? After all, it would have been pretty easy to take money off a total stranger. The majority of people trusted the other person not to take advantage of them. And that's because most people default to cooperation and assume others will do the same. In fact, your brain gets a rush of pleasure every time your trust is rewarded. Pays to share. There you go. This is a valuable lesson, because in order for society to succeed, there must be trust. And when more people trust, more people benefit. Here to tell us why most of the players trusted each other is neuroscientist Chess Stetson. So as you can see from the game, people tended to trust the other person not to take advantage of them. Our species evolved the ability to cooperate because it was very beneficial to us as a species. Altruism without godly intervention is not just a reality, but it's actually an evolutionary truth that Jordan Peterson doesn't seem to want to admit. Human beings have evolved mental tools to be able to act in both selfish and altruistic ways, depending on the situation. The so-called morality that Jordan Peterson wants to point to is actually evolved, and not due to Christianity. As if that's not enough, morals, for the most part, change over time, depending on the context that our species is in. Although there are some things that remain constant. For instance, thousands of years ago, it was seen as perfectly moral to punish a thief by cutting off the hand of the thief. Hell, even Jesus in the New Testament talks about mutilating people as a punishment. However, today you will be hard-pressed to find a single Christian who would actually seriously support such a measure of punishment. Christianity in its dogma is essentially the same. The context for which Christianity exists within in the Western world is different, however, and this is the point. It wasn't Christian values that brought about the Enlightenment. It was Christian dogma being pushed back against that allowed for the Enlightenment to arise. 
The only reason that the Enlightenment didn't happen sooner was because of the Dark Ages, which was a suppression of new knowledge, endorsed by the Christian faith. The free and open society of the West that Jordan Peterson applauds and argues for, rightfully so, mind you, is not the product of his faith. It arose despite of his faith. It wasn't some Christian prophet that brought about ideas of democracy, of responsible governorship, of individual rights. No. You have other thinkers. You have thinkers motivated by other things than faith to thank for those things, such as John Locke, Voltaire, Thomas Paine, etc., etc. These people rebelled against Christian dogma surrounding morality. It is thanks to their rebellion, their pro stance for a secular society that brought about the reforms needed to have today's society. Ironically, Jordan Peterson, in my opinion, is spitting in the face of Western society by arguing that it is a product of his faith, when in actuality it is a product despite his faith. Yes. There is a lot of things in the Bible that we would still consider moral. But there's also a lot of heinous shit, such as stoning naughty children, punishing people mixing fabric, and even God himself, Yahweh, kills children in cold blood as a punishment. None of this we would consider to be moral in any way. Now I would like to go into the last point of my video here. Jordan Peterson seems to confuse sheer authority with morality and ethics. After all, isn't the main argument by Christian apologists that something is moral because it is the word of God? Well, that's an argument from authority if I ever saw one. What if God were to spontaneously appear in the sky one day, across all of the world, and speak to everyone, and say, I want you all to murder your firstborn son. By the way, God actually did kill every firstborn in the Bible. It's kind of a famous chapter of the book, let's say. Now, if God were to spontaneously appear in the sky across the world and make this instruction to everyone, would this all of a sudden become a moral action? Fuck no! If any one of you watching this video right now in any way entertained the idea that this would all of a sudden now be a moral act just because God said so, you all can kiss my fiery ass. I don't give a flying fuck what Yahweh wants. I don't give a fuck what he thinks is moral or not. I will not kill my firstborn son. Period. Throw me in hell for it all you want. It's not gonna change. Any rational person, even a person who is religious, would see here with my example that might does not make right. A simple authority does not grant you correctness. It is the height of intellectual laziness to essentially tell Jesus, take the wheel, because I don't want to be responsible for my own moral actions anymore. I don't want to do the right thing because it's the fucking right thing to do. I want to let you be in charge. Tell me what to do. You see, an atheist actually has to be held accountable for their actions. I'm not saying that that's not true of a Christian either, but it seems to me you can get away more easily with rationalizing to yourself as well as to the rest of society as to why you did something that actually is pretty fucking immoral. You see, Jordan Peterson doesn't seem to understand that what we consider to be moral or not is, for the most part, context-driven. Hard physical punishment made sense back in the day when people still had to struggle to survive. For most of human history, there has not been the infrastructure to imprison people in a humane manner, which is why in the very early days of civilization, hard physical punishment as a deterrent to crime actually made sense. Of course, today we consider that to be immoral. I would say rightfully so. But if it is what needs to be done, it is what needs to be done. And if you go back in time mentally to ancient Greece, it actually makes sense that women weren't allowed to vote, unlike the men, 
After all, democracy in Greece arose because men were conscripted into the army to defend Athens. The bargain in all of this was that men got the right to vote. Does that mean that we today consider it to be a moral act to withhold half the population from voting rights? That is a question that I'm going to leave to you, the audience, to discuss with yourself as well as with others. But I can tell you that considering the context of how it was back then, it actually makes sense. And that's the point. The morality that you speak of, Peterson, the reason you think it is unquestionable is because it makes sense. But time and time again, we see throughout history, as the context, the environment of humanity changes, so does the conscripted morality. Even religions and their scripture and the orders from the deity that the scripture proclaims changes over time. Jordan Peterson doesn't understand why an atheist wouldn't just be completely selfish. Because after all, from a solipsistic viewpoint, it makes sense for me to be entirely selfish, right? I should just be going around and stealing and killing anyone in my way. Because from an egotistical viewpoint, that makes more sense than to be altruistic and work together with other people in a team. Well, what Jordan Peterson doesn't understand is that no man is an island. I know it's a meme at this point, but guess what? We live in a fucking society. And unlike what the anarchists, for instance, want to believe, there are such things as social contracts. Deal the fuck with it. You see, from an egotist's perspective, it makes perfect sense for him or her to be entirely selfish and be destructive to everyone else as long as it benefits them. Thing is, though, to everyone else, it doesn't make sense. To everyone else as a collective, it makes sense that we have a punishing system to deal with those individuals who don't want to play along with the rest of us. There may be a personal sense of morality, but there is a collective sense of ethics. Hence, guess what, Peterson? We now have a sense of morality in society. Because the action of punishing the individual behaving badly now makes sense due to the context. Most of what you consider to be moral or not is context-driven. That being said, I don't think Peterson is off the mark when he talks about the importance of monogamy and marriage. However, the reason I argue for those things, why I argue that marriage is an institution that should be celebrated in society, is not because of religion or because of a sense of morality. I'm an atheist, for the first of all, and like I explained, I think morality is context-driven. The reason I argue for things like monogamy and marriage, things that Jordan Peterson argue out of morality, I argue out of practicality. I see the statistics of children who come from broken homes, homes where the parents are divorced, and I see that they are overrepresented in crime, depression, mental illness, and drug abuse. In other words, here you have me, an atheist, who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in divine morality. And I can agree with a Christian like Peterson and argue just as passionately as him in favor of something that he considers to be a religious institution. And the ironic thing here, Peterson, is my way of thinking about this, looking at the context and then making a judgment, is what brought about the Western society as you know it. And Christian morality doesn't even come into the equation and still produces a result that goes in line with yours. And hence, I think we have come full circle in this video. Now, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video, and there will be more on Jordan Peterson. They will be even better, in my opinion. And I think you will like the next ones to come. Trust me, I've only scratched the surface of Jordan Peterson. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching. By the way, make sure you are subscribed and click the bell because YouTube doesn't always notify you when I upload a video. In fact, that's the way it works now with most YouTube channels that you're subscribed to. Bye. This is why I have such frustration, say, with people like Sam Harris, the sort of radical atheists, because they seem to think that 
once human beings abandon their their grounding in the transcendent, that the the plausible way forward is with a kind of purest rationality that automatically attributes to other people equivalent value. It's like, I just don't understand that. It, it, they believe that that's the rational pathway. What the hell is irrational about me getting exactly what I want from every one of you whenever I want it at every possible second? Why is that uh, irrational? And how possibly is that more irrational than us cooperating so we can both have a good time of it? To me, I think that that the universe that people like Dawkins and Harris inhabit is so intensely conditioned by mythological presuppositions that they take for granted the, the ethic that emerges out of that as if it's just a given, a rational given. And this, of course, precisely do, not Nietzsche's observation as well as Dostoevsky's. That's Nietzsche's observation. You don't get it. The ethic that you think is normative is a consequence of its, of, its, of its nesting inside this tremendously lengthy history, much of which was expressed in mythological formulation. You wipe that out. You don't get to keep all the presuppositions and just assume that they're rationally axiomatic. To make a rational argument, you have to start with an in initial proposition. Well, the proposition that underlies Western culture is that there's a transcendent morality.